10 seconds. Is this where the damn drumming and the music kicks in? Yeah. <laughs> going on everyone hello welcome thanks for joining us another episode of on the pipe podcast i'm your host as always tyler shepperton and today is otp tuesdays that is right march 3rd 2020 but it falls on a tuesday which means we're back for another weekly episode trying to bring you the most informative and interesting stuff that i possibly can but none of it's probably interesting at all. So I appreciate you listening even more so that you still tuned in, knowing that this episode may suck. I hope it doesn't. But if it does, let me know if it does. If you don't think it sucks, I highly encourage you to go ahead and whatever app you're listening to this on, go ahead and click that subscribe button. That will keep you in the loop and in the know and keep you up to date with all off-road knowledge going forward. That is brought to you courtesy of On The Pipe Podcast. There's my shameless plug. It's out of the way. I actually do got a pretty exciting episode for you tonight. Starting things off with a little bit of interesting changes going on in our intro there. So, as we mentioned before, our original co-host, Devin Byram, alongside former 250 West Coast Supercross champion, Justin Hill, who was barely just shy of a podium this past weekend at Atlanta. So shout out to Justin. That was an awesome ride put down by him. But Justin Hill and Devin Byram combined, they recorded our intro in the very room that this podcast was birthed, that this podcast was born. And so it is only fitting that it becomes full circle. And the music recorded in that room is now the intro to this very podcast. But as you mentioned at the beginning, we got a little bit of a change in there. This past Friday, we did a Facebook Live podcast just kind of talking about all things going on in off-road. It was an interesting episode, but at the end of it, we we were closing things out and Big Tom asked if that is where the music kicked in. And it turned into instant gold and it is now the intro for OTP. So now... I can not only just shout out Devin Byram and Justin Hill, but also Big Thomas Caldwell and I, and Rodney Tomlin because I threw the 10 seconds in there before. If you listen to our old episodes, then you'll remember our old intro. It had the 10 seconds and a different song in it. So brought that back because it's off-road. Got to have it in there. It's not off-road without that. But now we're going to be running down as much race results as we possibly can. We'll talk about the Mid-East Series because I was at that one. So I know a little bit more about what had happened. Then there was an IXCR this weekend. There was a Citra race this weekend. We'll get caught up to date the best that we can with all of those. And this is where I really need everyone's help because I can never remember to put my phone and computer on mute. So you hear those dings in the background of me getting a text. But what I really need your help for is there is a local series every three and a half miles, especially in the southeast. And I know there's a couple in Indiana, there's some in Pennsylvania, there's Wynoa, there's J-Day. Full Gas normally operates, which we cover Full Gas heavily, although there was not a Full Gas this weekend due to Mother Nature. But there's there's Wexer, there's Citra, there's Sorks, there's FTR, there's VCHS, and if that's the one that got canceled, then there's still the VXCS or whatever it is, there's... I think there's like a mid Atlantic or something like that. There is cross is is it crossroads? I don't know. There's another one in Indiana that's not IXCR. The the point being is there is series far all over the place. There is another series up north that I used to have a guy, I think his name was Jim, used to give me results and, and we'd go over it together. Anyway, I'm starting to ramble. Long story short. 
I don't even know what series are all out there, and I'm trying to cover them. And meanwhile, we're just talking East Coast. I don't know anything about the West Coast, but I do eventually want to get into covering it. So, uh, AMA Big Six works. Sprint Hero works. Sprint Racing, whatever they call it. Uh, Enduro Cross, like... All the stuff that's out west, I want to eventually cover that as well, in addition to the stuff that is on the east coast, but it is so hard to keep track of all of it. I don't know where all of it's at, so that is where you guys, the OTP listeners, the OTP fans come in. If you are the local series, I can't find results for any of them, even the ones that I do know of. Citra on Citra's website, there is no results. I posted in their Facebook page, I got no responses. So I don't even know how to tell you the results, let alone give you a breakdown of what happened at the race. So if you're out, boots on the ground, racing these races, at these races, got a mother, brother, sister, daughter, cousin, father, mother-in-law, brother who robbed somebody, who knows somebody that also robbed somebody. If you have any link to any of these series, shoot a picture of the overall results, DM them to at on the pipe podcast, and I will do my best to get them posted. I would like to have all the results in a singular place that everyone can go and look at. We also got a website. I paid for it again. It's back up and running running on thepipepodcast.com. Maybe we can work on compiling all the results there. I don't know. We'll figure something out. But the whole goal of this show is to bring attention, bring the spotlight, bring focus, bring all of that to off-road racing and that all starts with race results and what is going on locally and nationally as far as racing is concerned so if any of you can help me out with that if you have a good story of the race shoot me a dm let me know about it better yet we do these call-ins every single tuesday now we got a couple great guests coming up tonight's show we'll get to that in a second but It's even to the point where if a promoter of a series, if you are the promoter of a series, if you're working on the track crew, or if you're just a fan that's out there soaking in all the action, let me know. Maybe we can get you on a phone call and hear exactly what happened at your series, because after all, that's what we want to know. Even if I can't find all the results, I can read through them on here just as well as you can look at them and read through them in your head. What we want to know is what happen i can read results in black and white but that doesn't tell me what happened out there in those woods over the course of two to three hours and that's what we want to know so if you can help me out in any way with that i would appreciate it because i think helping out with that kind of helps everyone hand in hand so thank you in advance if you take me up on my offer anywho Getting into tonight's episode, I first want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to our great friends over at Armored Graphics. They are the Loan Show sponsor. They've been here from the beginning. They have helped us out tremendously. They designed our logos. They designed all the JGR MX Factory Suzuki graphics. That means they were doing Chad Reed's bike last year. They're still doing RC, the GOAT, Ricky Carmichael's bikes this year. All those Suzuki's, they design them, so that's really cool. They also, as I mentioned, helped out us a lot throughout the years. This podcast has been going on for two and a half years. It'll be three years before we even know it, which is kind of um, kind of amazing. I, I, I can't believe it. It's pretty cool. But now we're hitting it heavy, we're hitting it hard, and Armor Graphics also made us some t-shirts. Now, I ordered, I think it was 60 of these t-shirts. I was like, hmm. That's got to be plenty. I am running low on t-shirts. I'm all out of 2Xs. I believe that I am all out of smalls. I'll have to double check. And I'm very, very low on larges and mediums. And I'm getting low on extra larges. So if you want a shirt, let me know ASAP. We'll try to get them done. I've had a lot of people talk to me about hoodies a lot more than I thought. I don't know what to do about that because I didn't want to pay all that money to order a bunch of hoodies up front and springtime come and then it's too warm to wear a hoodie. If a hoodie is something that interests you at this point, let me know. I I have no problem putting in an order, but I'll probably just get orders first and get payment first and then we'll just get them all made together and distribute them out that way rather than ordering a whole bunch of them and having to sit on them for a year. So if you want a hoodie, let me know. If you want a t-shirt, let me know. If you think my show sucks, let me know. Because those are the things that help us grow and help us get better. But anyway, 
Thank you all for joining us. We're going to go over some of these race results, and then we will be joined by our Middies Hair Scrambles overall pro bike winner. He was also the Big Buck top amateur and the winner of the 250A class Phoenix Racing Hondas. Brody Johnson will be joining us tonight on the podcast to talk about his training routine and really talk about his race as well. And then directly after that, we will be joined by GNCC junior trail boss, Jared Bolton. So we'll be able to hear from him, which he is a wealth of knowledge. So super excited to hear that interview and bring it to you guys as well. Other than that, it was a cool weekend of racing. I myself am, I've been racing two series for as long as I can like the past several years I've raced mid East and GNCC at a bare minimum. So this whole thing started because I am a self-proclaimed dirt bike nerd. I love racing. I love riding. I love keeping up with all of it. And so I race myself and I do everything I can to be able to make sure that I can keep that up because coming from a wrestling and combat sports background, I've competed in something my entire life, and so racing is what fills that void now, which is pretty cool because I've only been riding for a little over five years, but I think I've done pretty well in that time, and it's cool that I'm finally, that I'm at the point where I'm seeing that progression take place, and I'm, I'm getting faster and getting faster, and I definitely don't want to lose that, so as long as I'm physically able to go racing i will be at a racetrack on a starting line right next to you as much as humanly possible because i freaking love it and you wouldn't be listening to this dirt or you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you didn't love it as well so i'm a racer i'm out there right with you guys granted not the fastest not the fastest but not the slowest not the slowest so that uh that's good I take pride in that. Um, Anyway, went to the Mideast Hair Scrambles. It was at Harris Bridge in Woodruff, South Carolina. It is a very familiar track to the Mideast Hair Scramble series. We've been racing there for a long time, and usually it is hard packed, square edge, and dusty, like a ton of dust, except for to start the 2018 season. It was the first round, and it downpoured rain it was so gnarly it was really gnarly mud but um this week didn't know what to expect kind of thinking another mud race with all the rain that we've been getting in the carolinas and it even rained last week leading up to the race but let me tell you something we came fresh off of probably the best big buck dirt that we've ever seen straight into Middies hair scrambles probably the best harris bridge dirt that i've ever seen out in the woods, it was beautiful, it was tacky, tons of moisture, tons of grip, even places that looked slick, you could lay it over and it was not slick, it, it was tacky, your bike would grip right to it, and uh, I really had a blast, I think the track was fast, so fast doesn't really suit my riding style, I like tight and technical, and the gnarlier the better, but uh, it was a fast track, but man, The flow of that Harris Bridge course is so much fun. I love racing there. You go through all these sections of trees where the corners are just so bermed up from over the years, and you literally just go outside to outside, just railing those turns through the woods. It's it's pretty unreal. I really like it a lot. But it was very important this past weekend to be searching for all the the smooth lines the main lines were really 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 bumpy they were square edged and big bumps so um a lot of searching for that smooth line maybe uh what i was doing is running to the outside and cutting it in early and coming up on the inside out of the turn kind of avoiding that main line to keep it smooth through there and my back very much appreciated it monday and tuesday all my muscles hurt but my back my spine all that feels good because i was standing a lot which pumps me up i sit here and look at these pictures and i get super excited that i was standing in them because i have in the past had the problem of sitting down way too much just sitting and getting so it makes me happy when i see myself in a picture and i'm standing but nevertheless you guys do not care to hear about my race although i had a really good time i raced 25 plus ab and i got fifth which got fifth i was like ah I won the first round, but I knew that was kind of a fluke because it was a mud race. 
And then getting fifth in this pass round, I learned that I have a lot of making up to do, which I'm, I'm very happy about because it pushes me to get better. And I rode fast. I rode really well. I, I rode fast for me. Let me go ahead and, and put that disclaimer out there. I did not ride fast, clearly, but I rode fast for me. I felt like I did good. I didn't fall at all, and I didn't pit, which I never pit in a two-hour race. So for me, everything went well. I was pushing myself. Um, I, I beat a lot of people that I'm usually pretty close with or swap back and forth with. I, I beat a lot of those people, so that made me feel good about it. But, um, yeah, long, long story short, I, I thought I did decent. And then I went back and looked at the overalls and everyone else in my class ahead of me was within like two minutes. So two minutes in an AB class, my second race racing in an AB class, I was like, okay, like that's a good place to build on. That's a, that's a good starting point. Let me, let me go ahead and, and, and be good about myself and, and know that I'm going to go up from here until Monday comes and all the race reports start coming in and everyone keeps talking about their races and what happened during the race and <laughs> turns out every single person it seems like that was in my class posted all sorts of stuff like oh I had to go back in and, and change a, a brake lever and while I was doing it I, I killed a chicken and plucked it and was able to roast it in the oven at 300 degrees for two hours before I ate it and then got back on the track and was able to work my way back up to second place. And then someone else that they, they caught, they thought they caught, they thought they saw a deer bra. So they got off and, and they went to go inspect the deer bra and see what was going on with it. Turns out it was a regular deer, but after they figured that out, they got back on their bike and they were able to push back up to a third. Um, basically, it seems like everybody in my class had some type of issues that took them off the track for a while. So, as I mentioned, I had no falls. I had no things worth noting. There was a pretty gnarly hill climb. Had no problems with it. Every single lap, rode as hard as I could. And uh, everyone else seems like they had chaos going on in their race, and they still beat me by two minutes. So, got a lot of work to do. Got a lot of catching up to do. But I'm excited for it, and I'll be back out there at the next one. I'll also be racing this weekend at Florida, so I'm pretty pumped about that. Not really. Florida's one of those races I said I wouldn't do again, but I'm going to do it because why not? It's a lot of fun. I'm just going to wear old gear this time, so that way my brand new gear does not get stained black permanently. So that's a fun fact. If you've never raced Florida and you're racing this weekend... Do not, I repeat, do not wear your new gear because it will be black and it will not come out. So there's your OTP fun fact for the up and coming weekend at round number two of GNCC racing. I'm going to be racing the 10 a.m. race and hopefully I can try to weasel my way into doing some announcing or helping out where I can. So... That'll be cool. I'll definitely be announcing at Big Buck, or not Big Buck, I announced at Big Buck. I'll be announcing in Georgia from from what I hear. So pretty excited about that and pretty excited to be down there once again with the GNCC racing family and all you guys that will be down there. So I'll have shirts, I'll have stickers, and I'll have a good time. So if you see me down there, come say what's up. Moving on. I get yelled at for doing these long intros, but it's necessary. I, I wanted to get that out there. So now it's out there. We're going to move into our middies hair scramble series, like we mentioned, taking the overall win on a Phoenix Racing Honda. It was Brody Johnson. We mentioned he was the Big Buck 250A winner and top amateur down in Union, South Carolina. He follows it up this weekend. Excuse me, follows it up this weekend in his second pro start, getting the pro overall victory. So huge congratulations to Brody Johnson. That's an awesome achievement and no doubt carrying a ton of momentum into round number two of the GNCC series. So that was awesome for him. Dylan Yearberry, we've talked about him several times on the podcast before. He is from New Zealand. He is over here racing. He raced last year. He's racing this year. Very, very strong. Very, very fast rider. He and Brody battled back and forth throughout the day, but it was Brody able to take the win. But Dylan Yearberry kept him honest and stayed right on his tail. So that was cool to see Dylan Yearberry up on the podium as well. And then our third place rider overall 
on the Husqvarna. It was Zach Davidson. Zach Davidson, no stranger to the overall podium at the Mideast races. He has been up there a lot. He won a lot of the double A races last year. He might have won the double A championship, to be honest with you. I'm not sure. I should have looked that up or at the minimum not brought it up live on the show for you to know that I didn't look it up and didn't know what it was. So pretend like you didn't hear that. But uh, no doubt, Zach Davidson, former youth champion, former youth GNCC champion, former multi-time Mideast champion, uh, multi-time GNCC champion, very strong rider in Zach Davidson. He comes out there and gets third place overall with a messed up shifter. He could like barely shift the majority of that race. I'd say 80% of that race, there was this like weird tabletop in the middle of a field. And as soon as you come down over it, it is an immediate right hand, like hairpin 180 turn. And then it's kind of weird that the way the course is set up after that, but there were some T-posts in the ground, some metal T-posts, and Zach somehow clipped one of them, and that bent his shift lever all to hell. And so that's what he was working with throughout the race. Said he could barely shift and barely get under it to, to shift up. So still able to put down a top three ride overall. And then I also want to give another shout-out, Tyler Palmer. Tyler Palmer got fourth place overall came through the line pretty much with Zach Davidson. So they were very close together. Tyler, I think, is another one. I think he's 17 years old. Uh, awesome for him, riding riding his way to a fourth place overall. That was pretty cool to see. So um, shout out to Tyler Palmer. That was pretty cool. He was racing the pro class as well. Going into Citra, we mentioned them briefly before. I am going to keep rambling right now as I refresh my Facebook just to make sure that I did not miss anything. I refreshed it. I did not miss anything. No one has replied to my message in the Seacher group. So we do not have any results for the Seacher race. I don't even know who won it. I think uh, the Hayes brothers run that series a lot. So it was the Sand Lapper Enduro, both of them strong Enduro riders, both of them in that area. Both of them former Citra champions. Zach has won the pro overall Citra championship before. So I would just go out on a limb and say that one of them two won it. I don't know. Like I said, can't find results for it. But I do want to take a brief moment on a completely serious note and and pay all due respect and uh, really just kind of bring awareness and, and put it out there that there was a Citra rider at the San Lapper Enduro that unfortunately lost his life during the course of the race, which we hate to see. It seems like it's happened every season that I can remember, at least someone. So um, my my sincerest, sincerest condolences go out to John Nutt and uh, the entire family of John Nutt. He was 56 years old from Albany, Georgia. From everything that I understand, he did not succumb of injuries from a crash during the race. From what I have been able to see, it sounds like he he stepped off his bike and um, passed away of, of natural causes, presumably a heart attack. If that is not what happened, then I sincerely apologize. Like I said, I just saw the news articles and um, the official post from Citra on their page. So um, sincerely apologize if that is not what actually happened to Mr. John Nutt. But the the point being that I did want to uh, mention it out there that on, on behalf of myself and I'm sure every OTP listener out there, um, very sad to hear and, and very sorry. And once again, I offer all of my condolences to John Nutt and um, his entire family. So um, moving along, IXCR, we mentioned they had a race this past weekend as well. IXCR, as well as Mideast, I would I would go out to and venture to say that those are the two largest regional series in the in the country maybe the east coast uh from everything i know i think those two are the the top premier organizations as far as regional circuits are concerned mid east is like a mini gncc now i mean they got event t-shirts buren hamrick we've talked about it several times before but he worked for gncc for forever and uh they do a really good job at setting up those 
those races. They do quads on Saturday, bikes on Sunday. So, um, really fun environment, really, really nice people. A lot of the same people that work Mideast also work GNCC, from the sign-up ladies to um, the, the scoring people. Um, and I, I say that in a broad term because I don't want to start naming names because I know me and I'll know that I'll actually – accidentally forget somebody and i don't want to forget anybody but uh lynn towery and then uh robbie towery and lucas towery they help out a lot of course they are the wife and sons of ricky towery who is the gncc officiator he's the one that waves the flags and does the prayer before all the races and then does the refereeing so um ricky towery obviously been around for a while but his whole family they made it a family affair they all help out and and join in and help in the middies as well as the gncc series so that's cool um rita jeffers she helps out with both series as well uh buren used to lay out track for gncc a lot of the the track workers um the whole chapman family I'm pretty sure that's what um, Jamie does full time. I think he he bounces back and forth working for Mid East and GNCC setting up tracks. So, um, I mean, all of them they they help out a lot. And so Mid East, it, it's pretty it's a pretty well oiled machine. Big numbers, a lot of riders going out there. So it's really cool to have that right in our backyard here. If you're anywhere around the Carolinas, they're venturing into Virginia this year as well. Or even if you're in Georgia, if you want to check out a good competitive local series, Midi's hair scrambles is a good place to start. Uh, it's a really fun race series, but that being said, IXCR is the exact same, which uh, our buddies over at the, the bottleneck live show, they got their own podcast going on. They are Indiana boys. They're right in the thick of it. So I'm right in the thick of mid East. They're right in the thick of IXCR. So that being said, Indiana's pretty far away from here. I don't know everything that there is to know about IXCR. I just know it's a really big and a really competitive series. And I know that they have a lot of representation on the national level as well. So there's always some good races going on up there. However, this past weekend, we'll go through the results real quick. It was Chris Bach taking the overall win. And Evan Earl was your second place rider overall. And Jake Fiddler would round out your overall podium. Now, these results did not come without controversy. That is right. Controversy up in Indiana. From what I hear, and I, I talked with Evan Earl just a little bit, but I don't have both sides or three sides of the story. But um, from, from what I know, Sorry, I was sitting here trying to read through it to make sure I, I got my bearings about me. Apparently, there's a lot of people that, that had some problems. Nick O'Brien and Levi Keller were all battling it out, and I guess Bach led the majority of the race up until that point. Well, Levi Keller ended up pulling off for reasons unknown to me, and Nick O'Brien made the pass on Evan Earl when Evan went to go pit, and so then they both got together and they were pushing each other. Apparently there was a line that everyone was taking, including the morning race from what I'm told. And they ended up passing Chris Bach in that line. And I guess Bach didn't even see when it happened, but I guess that's where they got around him at. Well, then Nick O'Brien ran out of gas with two miles left to go. And Evan would take the checkered flag by a minute and 14 seconds. But he would eventually be penalized two minutes off of his overall time due to that line that they took which would put Chris Bach into the overall lead for the win now I wish I knew more detail than that but that's all I got to offer you so a little bit of a uh, of a John Penton 2017 action going on there when uh, a line came into question that Thad Duvall took, he ended up getting docked a position, giving Caleb Russell the win. Sounds like something similar to that effect here, where uh, Evan Earl gets penalized two minutes for taking a line that was deemed to be illegal. And I don't know the line, didn't see pictures of it, don't know the measurements of it, didn't put a tape measure on it. I can't tell you any of that. All I know is what I told you, and that is what happened to where Chris Bach 
gets the overall win after Evan Earl gets penalized, moved to second, and then Jake Fiddler would round out that overall podium. If you know any more about that, let me know. I'd, I'd love to discuss it and really just like to know what, what happened from multiple sides. So that is what we got so far. That was the Mideast and the IXCR results. Like I said, I know there was a lot of other racing going on. I'm not 100% sure what all it was. So if you do know, let me know and we'll let you know. All right, so we're going to go ahead and head to the phone line now with the overall pro bike winner this past weekend at the second round of Mideast. Three-time GNCC champion, and as we mentioned, overall winner this past weekend, Phoenix Racing Hondas, not Husqvarna, Phoenix Racing Hondas, Brody Johnson. So, Brody, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Doing good, and I emphasize the, the Honda part. I caught a lot of slack from everybody because I, uh, I guess I got rambling in one of these things and said the wrong thing for you. But now I know, Phoenix Racing Honda, don't know how I messed that one up, and then Racing 250A this year, not four-stroke A-lights. <laughs> yep. So now we got that dialed in. But as we mentioned, man, this past weekend, you've you've raced in the pro class before, but you were able to get your first local pro overall win. How did that feel coming across the checkers first? Oh, it felt great. Uh, I didn't really expect it to be this early, especially this being my second year running pro. But I'd been... I've been able to get where I could run up front for most of the race and then fall back, but all the pieces fell together this weekend perfectly and was able to get it done. Uh, a lot of help, a lot of training this winter. Definitely looks like it's starting to pay off. Heck yeah. No, it, it's it's definitely paying off. I mean, that's a stacked field out there, and you were able to get the win. But speaking of, of things falling into place, and I don't mean to bring this up, uh, but – I saw the pictures coming out from the race, and your brother, Jonathan Johnson, I saw him take a tumble to the face. What, what happened there? Because you were right behind him when that happened, weren't you? Uh, yeah. Um, I guess that was the morning box. They didn't turn left there. And I guess we, we was coming up pretty hot there, and I guess he didn't really. And it kind of dropped off. It dropped off pretty steep. And I guess he must have grabbed a handful of front brakes, and he ate the dirt. And uh, I guess I led from there on. Well, yeah. Yeah, I think I left from there on. Uh, me and uh, Dylan battled there for the next couple of laps. Good deal. And, yeah, I mean, that, that was a hard-fought win by you. And uh, you were able to get the win over Dylan Yearberry. And then I think Zach Davidson rounded out the podium. So, no doubt a stacked field as uh, you were the one that, that came out on top. But, as you mentioned, you're getting a lot better, getting a lot faster. What do you do for training typically? Like, what is a, what is a typical week like for you? Um, I usually like the put a, a lot of miles in on the bicycle on a depending on the weather and stuff and just normal motos and gym work here and there all right and I, we were talking a little bit beforehand so you said you're 17 and you're doing online classes uh for high school you're in your junior year how how much of a role like how much does that help having that extra free time to dedicate towards riding Oh, it helps a whole lot. I mean, I spent January and February training in Florida with Trevor and Johnson and Jacob Betty there. And uh, without that, I I don't definitely wouldn't be in as great shape as I am now. And always still stuff to work on. But, I mean, this definitely helped out a, a whole lot. And uh, couldn't be any happier. Heck, yeah. With how everything's going. Yeah, and we talked to, to Jonathan a few weeks ago, and he mentioned training with you and uh, Jacob Beatty and Trevor Bollinger, obviously before uh, Trevor's knee injury. What's it like to kind of be 17 years old, I mean, in the mix with XC1 guys, XC2 guys, and, and that fast competition pushing you to get better? How much does that help? Uh, oh, yeah, that helps a lot. It's, I guess it's pretty most, – most kids' dreams to be able to do that. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be able to – uh, Trevor's helped us out a whole lot. Just just being able to watch and ride, just watching him ride, just being around him, you learn so much. And that helps, especially just how of how he rides and everything. I mean, it just helps out a whole lot. And I definitely wouldn't be as good as I am and without him. That's awesome that that all you guys are are jumping in there and helping each other, and I mean, really pushing the pace of the whole group. But. Brody, we mentioned that obviously the big news right now is you getting that pro overall at Mideast, but just a week before that, you got overall or top am 
at Big Buck, which wasn't your first overall amateur, but how does that feel at round one, getting right back on that top step, winning the class, and getting top am on the way? Oh, yeah, I couldn't be any happier with that, uh, especially just, uh, I mean, I had an awesome race, so I didn't get the best start, but I kind of moved it towards the lead there, towards the end of the first lap, and I kind of just tried to learn the track as much as I could, and I was able to put a gap on there towards the end, and I mean, it's a great way to start the season, just, in, just so you know where you're at and know what you're capable of, and it helps a lot with the confidence going into round two, so hopefully we'll be able to get it done again. Yeah, no doubt. And also one thing I wanted to ask you about is so last year um, you were on a different bike. This year, as we mentioned, you fixed over, you switched over to that Phoenix Racing Honda. What is what has been the difference in, in switching bikes, jumping from the Cowie to the Honda this year? Has it been pretty hard to figure out the new bike, or did it come pretty quick to you? Um, no, actually. I mean, I actually learned, learned the bike really fast. I, I love the thing. I mean, I guess – they were both Japanese bikes, so I guess there's not really too, too much difference as far as like the the frames and everything. Or they're all made, I guess, somewhat similar. But uh, I really love the Honda. I mean, I couldn't be any happier with it. It I, I feel real comfortable on it. I mean, and that's what you got to have to to be able to go fast and push your pace. I mean, if you're not comfortable on it, uh, you can't trust it. You wouldn't be able to, you'd be wrecking and wouldn't be able to keep the pace that you need to be running. Yeah, and I mean, both of those are, are good bikes, like you mentioned, but those Hondas, they do have a, a weird feeling about being very comfortable as soon as you jump on them, and uh, I, I think all you guys that made the jump over have shared that same thought on it, but how much, obviously, learning the bike, it comes and goes, I mean, with a little bit of seat time, you can kind of get the hang of, of any bike, really, but how big of a difference is it this year being on a team like Phoenix? racing Honda and, and having that much support and that much stuff in the background helping you out. Oh yeah, that's uh that's another that's another main thing. It's just it helps a lot with confidence just knowing that your that your box can be ready to go when you get there ready to go and just all the help that they have and just the knowledge and experience that they have and even the the team members and teammates just it's all I mean I guess you you really need every, everything, all of that, to, to be able to make it to the top. And luckily enough, they gave me the opportunity to ride with them this year, and I couldn't be any happier with it. Yeah, man, I, I think they couldn't be any happier with it either. I mean, impressive way to start out the season, both at the Nationals and the Locals. Um, so I'm sure that they're super pumped on, on making that investment in you as well, being that amateur rider on that program. But – we mentioned before you've won three championships. I believe they've all come on uh, mini bikes, or was one two hundred a? Uh, no, they was all mini bikes. I'm pretty sure it had been. Uh, pretty sure it was two sixty fives and one uh, little wheel eighty five championship. Okay, but then I mean, j- ever since you jumped up on the big bikes, which sounds like you jumped up uh, like as soon as you could, basically. You've had impressive results. I mean, second in two-stroke A in – or four-stroke A, sorry, in 2018. But you had seven wins on your way to that. And then last year, yeah. a, a lot of tough battles with, with Simon Johnson, which he's a very fast and, and very tough rider as well. How is all of that – like, for instance, that 2018 title, coming up just a point short knowing that you won more than half of the races that year – how much motivation oh, yeah. does that give you to really get a championship on a big bike? Oh, yeah, uh, especially with being able to win that much. Uh, I think Bolton won it that year. Me and him had some great battles there uh, going all year. But uh, I think I missed the first few, and I and I had a bad race or two. But just being coming up one point short, uh, that just makes you even more hungrier than it really, I guess, really, really would have if I would have won it. So... I mean, it just makes you want to work that much harder over the off season to come back next year stronger, and that way you know you won't be able to. You know you're not the one going to be coming up short by one just by just one point. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you're you're well on your way to a, to a solid start, coming away with the top am honors at Big Buck. But this weekend we shift things to the sands of Florida. It's really the only sand that we race all year long like that. 
Would you say that oh, you're, sure. you are a sand rider, or is this one of the races that, that you just want to get it over with? Um, I wouldn't really call myself a sand rider, but I wouldn't say I'm bad at it either. I mean, with being now, I've been down here riding January, most of January and February, so that helped out a lot, and I actually came down this week to get back to the sand. I mean, it's, it's a whole different sand down here. I mean, go to, uh, around the house there, the sand, I mean, it's not really sand or not, nothing like down here. I mean, you got to ride it completely different. So hopefully all of that time down here and this week will pay off and see if we can get it done again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well man, I'll be rooting for you. I think you definitely got to be the, the favorite coming in. And as far as 2020 is concerned, I mean, I know in your mind, championship is the only option going into 2020, but what what's after that? What comes after this season? Still doing a, a getting a couple more years under your belt, or I mean, what are you what are you kind of thinking early on, or have you not thought about? Um, it? I've, I've thought about it. So I mean, just really depending on how this year goes and my overall number. Of, I mean, if I feel like I'm ready next year, I'd definitely go to XC two. But I wouldn't want to go to XC two to go up there and run in the back, and that. I wouldn't feel like I'd be getting as much out of it. I'd rather be able to at least run up inside the top 10, top five for most of the race, if, if not the whole race before I'd be able to go up there. You'd be, I feel like you'd be able to learn more. It, we're still running A class if you was running towards the back of the pack in XC2. It's just a lot better uh, recognition rather than winning A class than a back of the pack XC2 rider. But hopefully, hopefully I'll be ready enough uh, but by the end of this year. My goal is to be inside the top 20 all, most, most all the races this year, and I feel if I can do that, I'd be a decent uh, XCT runner. But just, I guess it just depends on how everything goes and how we stack up at the end of the year to, to make that decision. Well, good deal, and, and lucky for you, you got someone in, in the same house, on the same bike, on the same team with the same last name that you can kind of uh, base your results and base your times off of to help make that decision. But, I mean – 17 years old, dude, you got plenty of time ahead of you. So uh, look forward to, to seeing the rest of it develop throughout the season and, and look forward to seeing your racing this weekend and, and try to see if you can click off another win in that 250A class. But, Brody, I know there's a ton of people that help you out. Are there? Uh, who would you like to say thank you to while you're on here? Oh, yeah, the whole uh, Phoenix Racing Honda team. I mean, they've done so much already this year to help make sure we're ready to go. Uh, Jacob Fetty, he's helped us out a lot this season already to get ready to prepare and train him and throughout the throughout the week, even now, of the right training. And uh, definitely got to my mom and dad for all they've done. And I wouldn't be nowhere without them. And Jonathan helps, helps me, keeps me pushing during the week. And like you said, it's uh, God being able to key off him and pace off him uh, helps out a whole great deal. And even just riding at the house, just being behind him for even just a lap or two, you, you always you always learn something, always got something to learn. And uh couldn't help couldn't thank him enough for all he's done and just everybody on the whole team and all oh, thanks for all they do. All right, good deal. Well, like I said, thank you very much for taking some time out and uh last thing I wanna point out, man. I mean, you got your first uh, on the pipe T shirt on Sunday right before the race and then you won the overall. So not saying that's the reason why you won, but you can't prove it's not. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got, got, to, got to do something with it, hopefully. Hopefully that T-shirt will get us another win this weekend. <laughs> there we go, man. That's what I like to hear. But All right, Brody. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you this weekend. Good luck. Yep, yep. Thank you so much. Yep. So there you have it, and a big thank you once again to Phoenix Racing Honda's Brody Johnson. As we mentioned several times already, he got the pro overall victory this past weekend at the Mideast race, as he mentioned, in his second career pro start. So very awesome for him. Also coming fresh off a top amateur, as we mentioned as well. He got his first top amateur award last year at round, it ended up being two. So Big Buck got canceled. He got his first top amateur award at the Georgia GNCC in 2019, and he's racked up several of them along the way to this point, including at the first round of the 2020 season at Big Buck. So very awesome to hear from him and kind of see 
how much he's accomplished and the dedication that he's put in to be 17 years old and where he is at right now. So no doubt we're going to see a lot of really good things out of Brody Johnson in the years to come. And I'm excited to watch all of it unfold as he is a, uh, a local guy down here as well from Landrum, South Carolina. So awesome to, to hear from him and get caught up. But moving into our next guest of the evening, this man I'm sure... All of you guys know who he is. It is Jared Bolton, otherwise known as Bolton. He is the junior trail boss at the GNCC series alongside Ryan Eccles. So between the two of them, they lay out the trails. They are responsible for making the tracks that we race on at the GNCCs. And he also works full-time for Racer Productions up in Morgantown, West Virginia, where he deals with stuff up there as well, which... As a lot of you already know, I'm sure they also deal with Pro Motocross, the same company, Racer Productions. They deal with Pro Motocross, GNCC, uh, ATV MX. They do the Ricky Carmichael Supercross that will be going on next week at Daytona. And they also do the Amateur National Championship at Loretta Lynn's. So they do a lot of different stuff. So Jared's involved with all of that. But we will get to him now and hear his side of the story and some of his experiences with working for GNCC. The man, the myth, the legend, Jared Bolton. How's it going today, Jared? Oh, man, it's going awesome. Uh, sitting down here in Florida right now, it's been like 80 degrees all day just to kind of break up and looking for. It's uh, beautiful down here, kind of probably the driest I've ever seen it here, but hey, you know, that's part of it. We're expecting a little rain Thursday, and it should just make things primo. Yeah, and I think uh, the weather's going to play into it this weekend because it'll be probably the warmest weather that pretty much anyone has raced all year. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, you know, we, we've seen that before. I mean, I can think back to, like, Steel Creek in, like, 07. You know, we had that epic battle down to the finish line there with, with Barry and Barry Hawk and Glenn Carney. And, man, it was, like, pushing 80 degrees that day at Steel Creek. And, you know, that don't happen very often. And those guys weren't ready for that. And there are people dropping like flies and, I, I, you know, I don't. I think everybody's fitness level is a lot different now than it was back then, but uh, it's still it's going to be brutal. I mean, the weekend's looking a little bit better, but you know, it's still uh, not everybody's ready for that heat just yet. No, I don't. I don't think so. Well, everyone outside the pro class, because it seems like everybody in every pro class has been in Florida this whole entire time, and they're down there this week, so they should all be good, I would think. Oh yeah, yeah. Those guys. This is going to be nothing to them. You know, it'll be a be a walk in the park for those guys you know and I, i've been down here since uh a few days after big buck you know we stopped in georgia first and kind of scouted some stuff there and I, i've been here since then I've, I've seen some of those guys around and uh the heat ain't gonna be any problem to them no i, I don't doubt it but you mentioned that it's the dry so you've seen it down there in a while what's the track looking like right now as far as what we've seen or trails we've ridden in the past versus this year i mean what's the what's your initial opinions i mean it's tuesday now what how's it going to all develop by the weekend well i mean it's uh like i said it, it is the driest i've ever seen and right now it's like you, you you can't stand to ride with another person at the moment um you know we just wear open face helmets you know we usually don't have goggles on or anything like that it's just you know a little too much when you're when you're setting up mm-hmm. but uh you know I'm, I'm definitely thinking about running some sunglasses or some safety glasses or something the rest of the week because it's uh it's tough kind of following somebody and uh i think saturday is going to be real brutal for the atv guys just just being able to see everything um but like i said we've also got some rain coming later in the week it's gonna cut down on that a little bit but it's still uh there's places that usually have standing water out here and uh (laughs) that standing water is actually really hard to find you know there's there's big mud pits in the parking area still have water in them but it's a considerable amount less than what it's been the last few years wow interesting interesting note because yeah usually there's a whole bunch of mud and and standing puddles down there that have actually claimed a a few people throughout the years yeah yeah, exactly and you know we we don't like that any more than the the riders do so we've you know done a lot better job the last few years of staying out of that stuff and uh this year we've kind of gone back into some spots that we haven't done in a few years because they've been they've had so much water on them in the past and now it's uh the water's way down and you can pick your way around these puddles a lot better and uh 
there's even some stuff way out on the back part of the property that we've uh, we've never ran the race in before, or we've only ran parts of. I think we're going to try to we're going to scout around out there tomorrow and see what we can find back in there for the for the bikes on Sunday. Sweet. Is there uh, has there been any appearances from the alligator in the start area yet? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I actually uh, haven't seen it. I think he's uh, retreated somewhere else. You know, with a little more water. <laughs> probably somewhere even a little cooler because it's uh man it's hot out in that field right now and uh i think he's hiding somewhere dang well he's he's probably smart to get out of the sun then but um oh yeah jared i, I want to start back at the beginning i mean i know you used to do videos in the past and race in the past but how did you how did you get into the position that you're in now with mx boards and gncc like how did all that develop and and what were you doing initially when you first went there compared to what you're doing now Oh man, you know, it's, uh, my story is about like most people that are, uh, involved in racing these days, you know, my, my dad raced and, uh, of course I, I got into racing. I mean, I, I got a little later start on the racing side than most people, but you know, I started racing when I was like 13 or 14 and did that for quite a few years and, uh, kind of started shooting some video on the side, just did some local races. And then in 2010, I got together with, uh, Rob Mitchell and Charky Hugel, and we did the Off-Road Junkies website. And mm-hmm. we, we weren't really taking it serious, you know. We were out there just having fun. We went to all the GSBCs that year. And uh, towards the end of that year, I just got asked, hey, you want to shoot for the TV show? And I'm like, well, heck yeah, why not? You know, so that was a good, uh, really good foot in the door position there. And I did that kind of through the next year. And then, uh, like, partway through 2011 was when uh, – Buren Hamrick that does the Mid-East Series. Buren left, and uh, Barry Hawk was kind of doing all the track layout stuff on his own, man. And I kind of told Barry one day, like, hey, like, I've helped put on some local races. If you ever want any extra help, let me know. And uh, next thing I know, I had a staple gun in my hand and was going around <laughs> stapling arrows <laughs> on trees. and Kind of been doing that ever since. And so I kind of did that for a few years, traveling from back home in North Carolina. And then... Uh, Met my now wife. She got hired on with uh, race productions as well at the end of 2013. I met her in early 2014, and then by the end of 20 by the end of 2014, I moved up to West Virginia and started doing all of this full time. And uh, Barry Barry was still doing everything back then, and Barry kind of moved on to the coastal deal, and we hired on Ryan Eccles, and now Ryan and I are the ones out there sticking arrows on trees. And, out there, I'm out there running sweep and just doing whatever it takes to make these events happen. Awesome, man. It's cool to see how much has developed in that time frame and, and how much work that you put into these races because I know you're like an encyclopedia of knowledge with everything going on too. So um, it, it's it's cool to see how much work you do put in. And you mentioned ride and sweep. That was, talking to my buddies, that was like the biggest question that everyone had is, how many hours a weekend do you put on a dirt bike riding these tracks? Uh, you know, it's it's not, it's honestly not quite as much as people think. I'd say average is right around 10 hours. So it's really, you know, it's about five hours each day. It's, it's nothing too crazy. I mean, it's, it's definitely long days. And then there are some races where I might go a little over that. And some races I go a little less, but, uh, it's uh it's definitely interesting and you know always something going on always a good time riding even oh i don't know if uh those really nasty mud races aren't always the best but hey any day on a dirt bike's better than you know sitting at a desk somewhere that is a hundred percent true so um but you mentioned ryan eccles obviously you guys are both trail bosses out there as you're known as when you guys are setting up a track I mean, who gets the the final say of where the track is going? Do you guys kind of game plan before you get there, or do you kind of get there and walk it out together, or how does how do the tracks develop at each round? Well, we we usually have an idea how we want to do it, and uh, I mean, like these last two races, you know, Big Buck and Big Buck, and like I said, we stopped in Georgia and did a little bit, and then we're here in Florida now. Uh, all three of these, we kind of just. Ryan will go one way, I'll go another, and we kind of, you know, piece something together, doing a little bit each, and then uh, Ryan will handle, like, the uh, the micro courses and whatever else needs to be done, and then I'll kind of piece together the uh, the youth stuff, and then 
I kind of take on more of the, the technical type stuff. I make the map and determine the mileage and where the mile markers and checkpoints are going to go and all of that stuff. So we, we split it up pretty good. And, you know, I, I always say, like, I, I do a lot, but, man, Ryan really does a freaking lot. He's the man with the plan most of the time. <laughs> Dang. Well, I'm, I'm sure it takes both of you guys doing that to be able to get these things going every weekend. And I know there's a whole big old track crew out there helping as well. But how much of a difference is it like Hogwaller or Big Big Buck been racing there for years, Steel Creek been racing there for years. Last year, we went to the Boy Scout camp out just outside of Beckley. That was the first race that had ever happened to that property What's the what's the biggest differences between going to a brand new piece of property for the first time or going somewhere with so many pre existing trails going all over the place? Well, the the places we've been going to for years, you know, usually we've got a we, we know what we want to do before we get there for the most part, and uh, it, it's easy. We can we can travel on Monday, you know, maybe get there Monday evening and ride around a little bit and start on it real hard Tuesday morning and be done. By Thursday afternoon, we're, you know, we're in good shape and Friday's an easy day. But, uh, you know, somewhere new, we try to go a, a few days earlier, you know, we'll go on a Saturday or a Sunday or something, get in that little bit of extra time. And then <clears throat> actually in the, in the case of the, uh, the Mountaineer, you know, the Boy Scout camp, uh, we actually went down there in, I want to say that was like April of last year and, uh, spent a whole day down there riding around kind of figuring out what would work and what wouldn't work and then it made things a whole lot easier when we went back sweet yeah i'm, I'm sure that's got to pay dividends pre-scouting it months in advance that was actually ended up being one of my favorite tracks like definitely my favorite track of the year like i love that place and i'm excited to go back to it this year that was a cool piece of property yeah yeah i mean that's uh it's kind of funny it was uh it, it's so much different and uh it was kind of a challenge to us at first and we were going I, I, i'm really not sure if we can make this happen but you know uh, tim cotter kind of told us like hey you know this is a huge huge place like you know you guys can figure it out i got faith in you and we went out there and we figured something out and, you know by the end of that day we were riding around out there we were both going man i think this is gonna be really cool so it's uh it's gonna be uh it's, and it, this year will be even better. You know, we've got some ideas to make it even better than last year, and I, I'm excited to get back there too. I thought it turned out really great. Yeah, it was it was a lot more technical of a track, which is what I liked about it. I, I thought it was pretty cool. I liked riding it, but yeah, yeah, oh yeah, and I, I like that technical stuff too. You know, and it's ah, uh, you know, to me everything could be all rocky and nasty like that, or you know, or I like Camp Coker too. You know, it, it can be tight and twisty and sandy for all i care but hey you know you got you got to appeal to everybody too <laughs> oh yeah absolutely and that's why i think that's the that's the fun in in racing the national series i mean mid-east as you mentioned buren they put on a really good series i've been racing mid-east and gncc for a few years now and mid-east he does really well with what he's got but i think at the gncc level you see so many different types of environments i mean you, you go from the sand in florida to the tight pines in Georgia to the rocky stuff up in West Virginia. So I, I think it's really cool to get that mix of covering so many different types of riding, like you said, to appeal to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, and, and I think that's what, keep, what keeps people coming back is just, there, there's such a variety of it. And uh, I, I swear I say this in every single one of the track descriptions I do for the racer TV live show. I swear it seems like every week I say, Oh, there's something for everyone out here. <laughs> And it's kind of become a thing where I like make fun of myself in the middle of it and say, "Hey, I know what you you know what I'm about to say, but man, it's just it seems like everywhere we go, we manage to work in a tight section. We manage to work in some fast stuff. We manage to work in something technical. And it may not be the whole course, you know. Some of them are definitely different, but the variety and just the uh, the whole atmosphere of a GNCC is what I think keeps everybody coming back. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. Um, one thing though, I mean, obviously, um, you guys are racing micro bikes, you're racing mini bikes, you're racing mini quads, you got four by four, four wheelers, you got the sport quads. Now we got e mountain bike racing. How much different would the tracks be, say, if you just had to do bike only, or if you just had to do quad only? Like, how much does that play into 
the overall design of the trail, knowing that all types of different machines and skill levels are going to have to go down that same trail. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, you kind of probably already know what I'm going to say, and it's like you, you got to watch for, you got to watch out for everybody. That's that's the biggest thing. You, you got to make something that every one of those machines can get down. And you know, obviously, you know, there's places where we split the quads off and split the bikes off, but uh, the, the biggest thing is just being able to make sure everything fits and make sure that there's nothing that's going to cause a massive bottleneck. And uh, you know, we. Like I said, we, Ryan and I both really like technical stuff, but that's not always feasible. You know, there's there's places where we look at something and go, man, I'd love to just go up and down this hill or through these rocks or something, but we know what would happen if we did that. There'd be, come, you know, Saturday or Sunday morning, there'd be, you know, 200 quads and bikes sitting there stuck, and everybody would be looking at us going, what the heck, guys? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> so yep. uh, it's just uh, the, the biggest thing is just making sure that everybody can make it. Yeah, and so when there are sections like that, obviously you can't control nature, you can't control the weather, you can't control anything like that, but uh, race in the morning race, I mean, there, there's been several times where we kind of try out a section and it ends up getting rerouted during the race because it ends up being uh, too technical for a lot of the people in the race. Who ends up making those decisions and, and how do you go about making that decision to say like cut off a, a tough mud section that just like a spring broke and it flooded the whole place out that you weren't expecting? Um, how do, how do those decisions get made? Oh, it's pretty much a split second thing to be honest. Yeah. Uh, you know, usually somebody, you, you'll hear a report, you know, somebody will tell you, somebody riding by will tell you, or, or I'll come up on it or just on sweep or one of the other guys will, you, other guys on quads will just come across it and you know we kind of get there as a team collectively and we start helping people and then we go hey this this ain't working anymore we got to find something else and uh you know we'll kind of piece together something while, while all the mayhem's going on you know one of us will go around and find a different way to get around it and you know make sure it's not going to run onto another section of track or you know cut off a huge piece of it or anything you know so it's really there's really no rhyme or reason to, to how it happens. And, you know, we don't, we don't like to do that. Never, never want to do that. But, you know, that's the nature of the sport. Sometimes that, that has to happen. And I mean, it's, it's happened to me at, at races too, where I, I've been a racer, you know, I've come around and I've gone from second to sixth and I've also gone from sixth to second. So yeah. <laughs> I've been on both ends of that. Yeah, exactly. I think I have been too, but I was just asking that more from, just being in situations like that before just as a, a fan perspective just trying to figure out how those decisions are made but it seems like even when you guys are, are thinking at a split second like that you still always make the best of it so i'm sure everyone can appreciate that and, and see the really the experience that goes into it to be able to make a decision on the fly and have it turn out for the best so that that's awesome oh yeah yeah like i said and it it's never anything we want to do, and you know, there's real no no scientific way it happens. It just it just kind of happens, but you also got to be smart about it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And Jared, you've been out there for almost a decade now. I gotta ask. I mean, I we've talked over the years about sitting down and doing a podcast when you're back home in North Carolina, and just the way schedules have worked out, we haven't been able to do it. We can sit down and talk stories for hours. So. Um, still hoping that happens at some point, but just real quick here, what's one of your favorite memories that you've had so far being a part of the series and, and, or things that you've seen while being a part of it? Oh man, I was, I was afraid you're going to ask that, (laughs) you know, the, the, the truth is, you know, and uh, this is, this is my 11th season. I'm, I'm going on, you know, 10 years now and, uh, man, I, I truly don't know. There's just been so many things that have happened over the years and you know there's stories i can share and stories that i shouldn't share that have been really <laughs> good too you know uh there's just really just being able to do this as a full-time job has been the best experience for me you know it's yeah you know, there's definitely times that I, I get up and i'm going oh man i really just want to go lay in bed or man it'd be nice to just sit inside today and have to go out here but at the same time being able to get up and do this every morning, man, it's it's like a dream come true. Because I think I was probably like I was probably like 18 when I realized, like, hey, I really am not that great at riding dirt bikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And I ain't ever going to be a pro rider. And, uh, you know, it's kind of about that time that I started playing around with cameras and, uh, you know, kind of messing around at some local races, helping guys out and stuff. And I, it's just it's just funny to me. I, I'm kind of getting off track with this, but it's funny to me <laughs> looking back at how this all happened. Because I remember when I was like, man, I was probably like 13, 14. We lived in this neighborhood. And uh, we were the first house out there. And then, the, you know, they kind of built up the houses around us and everything. And uh, all the other kids that moved in that neighborhood were, you know, three, four, five years younger than me. And, uh, uh, you know, not everybody had motorcycles. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I made the best of it, and uh, we'd race bicycles. Well, it just so happens that I would go lay out this bicycle track that we'd race on through the woods, and, you know, you just kind of end up at the end of it. And since I was older than those kids, I'd usually win. I'd get to the end, and I'd tally, you know, I'd tally up the who finished where and all of this stuff. And it's just like I said, it, it blows my mind to think back to, to doing that. And, you know, that's that's what my job is now. And even you know, growing up going to races and watching guys like Jeff Russell or Buren or, or whoever come up to the start and give the track description and say, guys, you're going here doing this. And I'm thinking, man, look, look at that guy. He knows everything. That seems so cool. And then here I am. I'm I'm that guy now. <laughs> yeah, I, that's awesome. That's awesome how it comes full circle like that. Something that you were doing for fun as a kid is now what you're getting paid to do. And now, I mean, there's so many of those same or same so many of those kids in that same exact situation looking up to you, doing the same thing that you were doing back then. So, man, that that's awesome. And the whole. Uh, Realizing you're never going to be pro on a dirt bike and picking up a camera thing sounds familiar too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think there's quite a few people that share that same sentiment. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, man. I once again, you guys are down there setting up, working long days in the hot sun. So I really appreciate you taking some time to to sit and talk with us, and uh, really looking forward to the race this weekend and and seeing everybody again. Oh yeah, yeah. Me too. It's uh, hope, hoping it's a beautiful weekend and. Hopefully, uh, the following weekend up in Georgia is even nicer. You know, it's uh, got a challenging forecast right now. But the good news is they're only calling, you know, 30 and 40 percent chances up there of rain, you know, throughout next week. So hopefully that kind of pushes away and we get two really great weekends of racing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, it was looking the same for Big Buck and Big Buck turned out to be perfect. So, oh, yeah, most epic dirt I've ever seen at that place. I've been going there. You know, for years before I ever started working at the races, it's uh, it's incredible how how well that shaped up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you couldn't. You, I've never seen better dirt than there. Dirt there. I don't think you can ask for better dirt than what we got. So that worked oh, out yeah. really well. Yep. yep, it was it was a beautiful weekend. Like I said, ho- hopefully you know, hopefully they're all like that this year. Hopefully they're all just nice. I got my fingers crossed, and I'm hoping for it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thanks again, Jared, and uh, like I said, look forward to seeing you this weekend. Oh, yep, yep, sounds good. All right, bye, man. What a life, and what an interview. Big thanks once again to Jared Bolton taking some time out of his day to sit and speak with us. He's already spent a couple long days down there in the Florida sun, as he mentioned before, setting up the track so that way everyone will have a fun place to race this weekend. As he mentioned, sounds like it's going to be dusty, so you might want to prepare for that and also prepare for the heat if you have not been riding in the heat already this year. So a couple Words to words from the wise right there as Jared Bolton joins us. And as I mentioned on there, hopefully we will get a chance where we both have a schedule that aligns and we can sit down and do a more depth interview and uh, a whole podcast because Jared has been around the sport for a long time and I'm sure he has tons of stories that I would love to hear about. So hopefully we'll make that happen eventually one day. But I do want to take this time to say thank you all of you that tuned in or downloaded or listened to this episode. I really appreciate it. I've been trying to stay consistent on this thing. And it looks like it's paying off the month of February. We hit our all-time downloads record ever. So I basically did more downloads in the month of February then probably like the past year combined because we did let me do some quick math i i think 
somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of our all-time downloads were met last month alone in just the month of February. So that is great progress. That is excellent news. I'm really happy to hear that you guys have um, been tuning in and listening to the show. In fact, our last episode with Becca Sheets and Mike Widkowski, and um, also on that last episode we had was Josh Strang, of course. I don't know why. Sorry, it is getting late. So our last episode actually had the most downloads of any episode yet with Becca Sheets, Michael Kowski, and Josh Strang. So that is awesome. That's really cool to see. And also in the month of February, we were downloaded in 13 different countries. So that means 13 different countries throughout the world, people were downloading this podcast and listening to it, to which I could not be more appreciative or more thankful for. So thank you to each and every single one of you that tuned in, and I hope to see each and every single one of you this weekend at the Hogwaller Mud Bogger down there in Palatka, Florida for round number two of the GNCC series. As we mentioned before, if you run a local series and you have some information, get a hold of me. We'll make something happen because we're trying to bring all the knowledge to all the people Once again, subscribe if you like it, tell a friend about it, and we will see you next weekend, or excuse me, next week for another episode of OTP Tuesday. Thank you, everybody. Bye.